Hey everybody, Frank Finance here. Hope you're having a wonderful day. Today we're going to be doing a stock analysis on rocket companies. And for today's agenda, I'm going to give my price target for rocket companies. We're going to look at 2021 Q3 results. I'm going to give a brief business description, look at their org structure. We're going to look at the stock price history. We're going to look at performance versus their peers, the fundamentals and financials. We're going to look at mortgage interest rates moving forward and how they affect the price of rocket uh, companies. We're going to look at dividend information. And lastly, I'll give my thoughts on rocket companies as an investment. All right, my price target for rocket companies is $19 to $21 in the next 12 months. It indicates a 12 to 24% upside with rocket companies. And I believe the downside is around $15, one of its previous lows. And that indicates a downside of about 11%. All right, for Q3 of 2021, rocket companies reported 57 cents earnings per share. And on the analyst had them coming in at 48 cents. So they were able to beat uh, estimates by nine cents or about um, 18% on the EPS. So really good beat there. On the revenue side, um, rocket companies reported $3.16 billion or a beat of 206 million um, compared to analyst estimates of 2.95 billion or a beat of about 6.5% on revenue. All right, jumping into highlights for Q3 of 2021. If we look at revenue, revenue in 2020, Q3 was at 4.6 billion, compared to the current is 3.1. Now, total expenses exceed what it was in 2020, going from 1.5 uh, to 1.6. Net income is less than half what it was in the quarter of Q3 in last year. And on the EPS side, it's less than half of what it was last year as well and if you look at their year to date on a, a 2020 to 2021 they are definitely bringing in less revenue for the full year um, so far and that expects to be the trend into uh, q4 so they're not going to make up for that and and uh, have a growth um, on a year over year basis total expenses are also looking to increase as expected net income is um, going to decrease and earnings per share is significantly down from where it was last year. Looking further into the report, you can see that fourth quarter outlook is not as good as it was in Q3. So they're looking at a closed loan volume between 75 and 80 billion. If you look at Q3, that was at 88. So we know just right off the bat, the um, you know the revenue side is going to be lower because they make most of their money off of these closed loans origination volumes. Net rake volume at 71 to 78. You can see that that was uh, 86 in the in Q3. And then finally, this gain on sale of margin is actually a quite a big concern here. 2.65 to 2.9 um, compared to three. So even the margin is going to be decreasing significantly. Um, and that is lower than both what it was in 2020 Q3 as well as 2019 Q3 of 3.2, 4.5, and 3.05 in 2019, 2020, and 21. So we're seeing a decrease in uh, loan volume, and then the margin is basically um, a percentage of what actually they they make on that origination volume. And then on the net rate, net, net rate lock volume, again, same thing there. All right, so in short, what that's telling you is you're gonna have lower volumes and you're gonna have a lower margin on the, the you know, amount of traffic that you are having. So all that to be said is revenues are going to definitely decrease in Q4. And so, you know, there's a little bit of a slide here on the revenue that's gonna affect earnings per share. And thus it affects the value of the company. All right, for the business description, uh, Rocket Companies engages in a tech-driven real estate, mortgage, and e-commerce business in both the United States and Canada. Really operates two segments in um, the mortgage industry, direct-to-consumer and their partner network. The good news is while we're seeing volumes continue to go down for Rocket Companies, we are seeing their market share continue to grow, going from about 8% in 2020 of the market up to an anticipated 9.5% in by the end of 2021. So it is good to see that they're growing and they are the leader and number one ranked in market share um, in the industry, the mortgage industry. So um, good growth here, at least from a, from a market share perspective. 
so right, as i mentioned just now they are the number one home lender in america one trillion in transaction volume since um, their inception 2.5 client uh, million client loan serviced and 90 percent net client retention rate which is crazy um, their EBITDA for Q3 was 5.3 billion, um, and really they're just they they have a really great technology platform that makes it easy to buy and refinance your home. Those are the two biggest things where they make their money, and that's kind of what they're highlighting here is their portfolio, where home financing and home search and sales are the two biggest piece, and they're trying to get into the auto industry, solar and personal financing, and they build that all on their technology brand and culture um, <laughs> um, so they're saying there's a massive market opportunity 30 um, percent of the u.s gdp apparently um, is you know in this mortgage real estate auto financial services and solar i think that is uh, you know there's a little bit of an uh, over exaggeration here um, on the mock market opportunity because really they're in the mortgage industry and that's where they're making most of their money and will probably um, continue to be that way um, now where their real ambition is, is inside of the mortgage is to be the category leader. And they're putting here, um, what the category leader has in terms of market share, um, in other industries. And so this is actually, again, kind of back to more relevant to what is a uh, potential for them. So they, you know, are anticipating to get themselves up to 20 to 25% market share in the mortgage industry. Um, and that would be a really great um, growth is a really great growth opportunity. And if you look at their growth over the last several years, they are definitely on pace to do that. And so the reason why they've been able to have the growth that they have is because of this customer experience. They make things fast, they make it simple, and they make it easy. And one of the biggest and most uh, what people call a very stressful time to buy a home because they really want it it's so they really try to make that process as complete you know as um, less complex as possible simple easy um, it, you can do it on your phone you can do it in you know on your desktop um, yeah, I've done refinances with rocket uh, it's it's pretty simple um, and then they have this um, end to end so home searching home buying and selling refinancing they have this home closing by Amrock mortgage servicing as well. So, um, and then they try to, you know, uh, cross sell opportunities with Rocket Auto, Home home Solar and Rocket Loans. So again, these are a very, very small portion of the business. This is where they make their money, all right? So um, they're just trying to highlight here that throughout the value chain, they can make money um, through the whole process. And again, they're trying to expand into um, auto sales and home sales um, powered by, and this is this is uh, kind of the, you know, the juice behind it all is, is definitely their technology that enables them to um, make things fast, easy, and you know, accessible, and to have a good experience overall for their clients. Um, so that's really good. Um, extending to our partners, we enable clients to engage with the Rocket platform in a way that works best for them, and including these APIs, which um, just allow um, third parties to communicate with uh, Rocket. So that's really good to see. Now, one of the uh, most exciting things that I saw throughout this whole thing was this Rocket and Salesforce partnership or mortgage as a service. Now, if they're able to expand this, I'm not sure exactly what their... Um, their plan is here, but if they're able to package this up and sell it and turn it into more of a subscription basis for other uh, loan servicers or loan lenders, this is where they have a potential to actually have some reoccurring revenues and um, have a little less volatility in their overall um, revenue. All right, so jumping to the organization structure, starting out at the top, Public owns 20% of the voting power and 100% of the economic interest of Rocket Companies, Inc. Rocket Companies actually only owns 8% of the economic interest within Rocket Holdings. Now, the other 92% of the economic uh, interest is owned over here in Rock Holdings, Inc. This is where the founder and the founder owns this. So, 
for those who are buying rocket companies, um, RKT, you're only entitled to 8% of the economic interest or the net income in another way. So just know that as you are, um, and, and then from a voting perspective, also only own 20% of the voting rights and um, the class D shares of rocket company have 79 and the class D shares with 1%. So still most of the power um, from both economically as well as voting power is by the, um, the founder. So you really have to be, um, really have a bet on Gilbert, um, who is the founder of the company and has, again, majority of the economic interest as well as voting power. So just know that when you look at their net income, it's really not just um, all back to shareholders. Only 8% of that is entitled to shareholders. So if you are doing a DCF, make sure you have that in mind as only 8% of that is due to um, the shareholders and rocket companies. All right, looking at the stock price history for rocket. Um, so they, they originally IPO'd um, and started trading on the 7th. This is when I first got into my position at around $17 and I made quite a bit on the first day. In that second week of trading, things kind of dipped back down to where they were around opening, around 18, uh, 18 bucks. Um, quickly after, I'm gonna reduce down to the one year here. You can see that there are some pretty uh, large swings. So it first went up, I'm gonna go back here, went up into the $30 range for a short period of time. And then for a very, very short period of time, um, after into the March time period, that went up to $41. So I actually traded in and out of this twice, and then I entered into a position after. So when I saw it went up into the $30 range, I saw it, I sold around 28. Um, and then when it, um, a few months later, after I bought back in around 18 bucks, um, I sold this time, I held it and I sold around 32, if I remember correctly. Uh, I didn't get anywhere near 41, but I remember seeing it go up and I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. Um, but I sold it and then I, you know, quickly was able to enter into a position Well, I actually averaged back down. So I bought some at 28, I bought some at 24, and then I bought some more at 21 and then um, been buying more as it's continued to dip. So it's gotten all the way down um, here into the $15 range and it's currently trading around 16.86. Um, and so there's been a lot of volatility with Rocket. Um, when they first came out and were trading, um, refinance volumes were up, uh, mortgage volumes overall were up, margins were actually higher on their total volume. Um, and so their net income um, has been on a year over year basis is decreasing as well as um, the, all their volumes. So there's, um, there's a little bit of appears to be some cyclic cyclicality with their business as it relates to how many mortgages are being issued as well as how many um, refinances are happening with what we've seen over the last year um, actually year and a half now with uh, with with real estate there's a little bit what appears to be pent up demand and so we've seen those volumes go crazy and now they seem to be slowing down a little bit even though we still have some housing um, supply shortages, we are still seeing the volumes continue to go down and the estimates by Rocket themselves are also continuing to go down and we're seeing that reflected in the stock price. All right, next up, let's talk performance versus peers. Now this is only uh, stock price. This does not include any dividends or anything else. Uh, right now we got RKT in gray, UWMC, which is another mortgage lender, non-bank, um, probably the closest in terms of um, a similar model to Rocket. Um, Wells Fargo is a bank, JP Morgan in purple is also a bank, and SPY is the uh, S&P 500 index is in green. Um, so as you can probably, this is the two year chart. Um, you can see that Rocket and uh, U, uh, UWMC are only a little over a year old a piece, not even two years old. Um, so looking kind of at the price performance, um, since uh, August, August of, uh, of 2020, you can see that they've fairly tracked um, where the other players were for, for quite a bit of time. Um, and then over the last, um, let's see, since the beginning of the year, 
Um, both RKT and uh, UWMC have tracked pretty poorly in comparison to the overall market in the last two years. If we bring that to the one year mark, this is even highlighted. You can see that Wells Fargo, going back to the two year, Wells Fargo had been doing poorly in comparison to the other banks um, like JP Morgan. And uh, that, well, JP Morgan is a comparison. Um, and then that kind of flips at the uh, one year mark, Wells Fargo. Um, had kind of a turnaround and, and change in sentiment on their stock. JP Morgan was out as outperformed uh, the index in the last year. Uh, SPY is up 30%. And both UWMC and Rocket are down um, 30 and 22%, 22 respectively. All right, jumping to the financials for Rocket companies. If we look at revenue for 2018, it came in at 4.3 billion. 5.2 for 2019 and 15.9 in 2020, or a 200% increase in revenue um, year over year. For the last 12 months, they're at 15.375. And if we look at gross profit, that has been increasing. Um, EBITDA has been increasing as well. And then if we look at net income, that was reported 198 million in 2020 and had not previously recorded it for 2018 and 2019 until they became public so if we move on into the quarterly we're going to look at year over year starting in q1 of 2021 or 2020 so in q1 of 2020 at 1.4 in revenue 1.4 billion and in q uh, q1 of 2021 at 4.6 billion so a really decent healthy increase there from 230 percent now in Q2 of 2020, they had one of the best revenue uh, years they or revenue quarters they've had, I think ever at five billion dollars, um, and that decreased in Q2 of 2021 by 46 percent to 2.7 billion dollars. So, uh, you know, bad to see that there. And then in Q3 of 2020, they had 4.7, and year over year there was a decline of 32 percent in Q3 of 2021 to $3.187 billion. Um, so in the last two reporting, reported earnings, we've seen a 46 and a 32 year over year decrease in revenue. Um, that translates to a decrease in gross profits, translates into a decrease of EBITDA, and um, surprisingly actually did not, um, you know, year over year wise, actually see some more positive net income going from five, fifty, you know, in Q3 from 57 million to 75 million. So it's good that they're still bringing more on the net income side. And even on the earnings per share, they, they had an actual increase in Q3 from 50 cents to 54 cents. The main concern here is on the revenue um, and actually, you know, bringing, you know, keeping that revenue up as long as possible and hopefully avoiding any further guidance um, to the negative there. Now, if we move on over to the balance sheet, total cash and short-term investments is at $3.3 billion. Cash equivalents is at 2.2. If we go down to our total current assets, we're at uh, 28.9 billion. Um, and if we go down, sorry, sorry total assets is at 35.8 uh, billion liabilities. Total current liabilities at 2.6 compared to the short term um, at three and short term assets at three. And then our total liabilities are at 26.6 billion compared to total assets at 35.8 billion. So no major issues there. All right, so next up, let's talk about shares outstanding. In the last, uh, well, basically since their inception, Started around 100 million shares, and now they're at 137 million shares, um, a little over a year later. So really most of that dilution of issuing shares looks like it happened in the first seven to eight months. Um, and that's about a 37% increase in shares outstanding in, on a year, year on a year over year basis. So about 37% dilution um, on the existing shares that were you know, issued at IPO. So um, we don't like seeing that. Um, one of the, the reasons, reasonings that I could, reasonings, 
One of the reasons why I think this may um, be the case is that since IPO, maybe some options um, became available and they were executed and that increased the number of shares outstanding. So we'll wanna monitor this going forward to make sure there's not any further dilution um, that would take any value or, you know, um, you know, take more value away from the shareholders that are, you know, currently out there. So we we'll wanna pay attention to this. All right, looking at interest rates, these are important because historically, the lower um, interest rates have been, the more easier and more affordable it is to buy a home. That can be a good indicator on whether or not volumes are going to be increasing or decreasing. So if you look at the Fed, they've signaled that they're gonna keep um, short-term rates between zero and 0.25. Pre-pandemic, they were sitting about 1.5 all the way up to 2.25-ish, 2.3. Um, and effectively for the last um, little over a year, they've been um, definitely below 0.2, currently at about 0.08%, so very, very small. And they're not anticipated um, to really start increasing over 0.25 until 2023. All right, now if we go into mortgage interest rates, you can see over the last year, mortgage rates have fallen from about a little less than 3.75%, all the way down to low in January of 2021, the beginning of this year, at 2.65%. The high of this year was at 3.18%. And currently we're sitting a little over 3% at uh, the mortgage rate. Um, and then projected over into the beginning or the end of December of 2021, looks like it's going to be approaching 325 currently. So it does look like interest rates are back on the rise on the mortgage side, but we're gonna have to continue to monitor that to see if that continues to trend or if we're gonna see another um, trough in uh, another decrease in uh, mortgage interest rates. All right, real quickly on dividend information, the company does not currently issue dividends on a quarterly basis. There was a one-time special dividend uh, issued in earlier of 2021 of $1.11 per share. Um, moving forward into the future, I think it is definitely possible that RKT issue a dividend, but for the foreseeable at least a year, I don't think that is going to happen, at least not in, um, you know, in a year time frame. I don't believe we're going to need to see a little bit more stability in um, cash flow before we, I believe that they will authorize that. Um, but they definitely have indicated, you know, by doing a special dividend that they're not opposed to. Um, at least special dividends, or if they have anything that they can't use their capital on, they'll definitely put that money back to the shareholders, which is good to see, but also another indication that they don't know or have anything else to invest the money in. So mm, good and a bad thing there. Just depends on if you want dividends or you'd rather see them invest it back into the business. All right, lastly, $1 billion in buybacks was authorized by Rocket uh, a little over a year ago. And as of October of 2021, Rocket Companies had only um, purchased 5.7 million shares at 16.42, which is a pretty good price, actually. So they didn't buy at, you know, in the $25 range or the 30 or um, anywhere higher than, you know, kind of right where they're trading right now. So pretty good price in which they did on a repurchase, effective use of um, the, the, the share buyback program. Um, but they've only spent you know, $94 million out of the um, authorized $1 billion. So they still have a decent amount of uh, capital that they can use for buybacks. And if the stock continues to go lower, they can um, purchase back at a lower price. And as we mentioned in shares outstanding previously, currently about 137 million shares are outstanding. So if they uh, are able to purchase around the same average price of 1642 you can, uh, you know, just imagine they'd be able to purchase about five, uh, 57 to 60 million shares back. Um, and at that point, that'd be a really good buyback from 137 minus 60, you're looking at 70 something million um, shares outstanding. So that'd be a really good, um, really huge decrease as a percentage of, of shares outstanding, which would be excellent for shareholders, at least from a value perspective. So if they're able to do that, um, could actually provide some tremendous value. All right, so going to my thoughts on Rocket Mortgage as an investment. First off, the price target is moving lower to $19 to $21 in the next 12 months. That is from a previous uh, price target I had of $25 to $30 in the next 12 months. And so on the positive side for Rocket, 
they're positioned to continue to grow market share and they've continued to do that over the last several years at their current market share of around ten percent and they have ambitious goals to get that up into twenty twenty five percent of the market and it appears like they're on track to do that um, although that is going to be a challenge now one of the most exciting things i see about rocket is that the the um, mortgage as a service solution partnership with salesforce has a possibility of reoccurring revenue, which is so important in business. And that's the great thing about subscription-based revenue is year over year, you get it and you and, and once the initial setup occurs, and I'm assuming since Salesforce will probably do the implementation, really all Rocket is doing is getting paid for that initial setup and, and some reoccurring rates just for being one of the first to help get it established. So that's really cool possibility there. Um, and that should be launching in uh, 2022. Um, next on the positive side, interest rates look to re remain relatively low, which will help with refinancing and mortgage volumes. Um, the good news is they also had a higher net income on lower revenue. So even as revenues were decreasing, they were able to translate that into higher net income for shareholders. So still delivering a little bit more value. And there's still opportunity to buy back shares, so that will also add value to existing shareholders. Now on the downsides, and this is where um, you know I had to lower my price target on, on RKT, is it seems like the trend to lower volumes and margin, and volumes is important, but the margin is also um, super important, seems to be lowering. I would assume that the margin could stay relatively uh, stable, but it doesn't seem like that trend is occurring, which is very concerning to me. Um, and all that is translating to lower revenues and across the board. Although, as I said in the positive side, they have been able to translate lower revenues to higher income. It does appear that there, this rocket will have a cyclicality with it as it's tied to the housing market. Right now, the housing market is red hot. Um, we had we have low interest rates. We have you know relatively high volumes from pent up demand. It appears, um, and so there could be a uh, continuing lowering of the prices uh, prices of Rocket while the mortgage mortgage market may cool down. Um, I'm not a mortgage or, or, or sorry um, home home uh, market expert on uh, you know the the real estate market, but the market is hot and you know if you if that is a cyclical business then i think rocket will follow um in how much is actually being transaction and if the transactions are lower then they should have also lower revenues so there could be in the future um as the housing market goes maybe goes into a little bit of a decline in volume wise it could be um, a good buying opportunity for rocket in the future one other thing that i don't see as a Downside or an upside is the org structure. Um, really, here is you know as long as you know what you're getting, you're really not getting any voting rights. Um, very, very, very small voting rights. Dan Gilbert really has control of the company as well as economic interests as well as voting interest. So you better have confidence with him as a leader and being able to deliver value to shareholders and have motivation to do so. Obviously, he has a lot of that economic interest. He has a lot of the voting rights. So it does behoove him to actually continue to grow Rocket and deliver value um, because it's delivering value to himself. Um, and, and just historically, he has been able to build Rocket to where it is today. And so there's nothing in the past that indicates that he would be a bad leader going forward. Um, so that's why I kind of leave it in a, is it good, is it bad? I think it's 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 really individual to decide whether they are good with that. So far, I think he's clearly built a very strong company, so that's good. So right now, my position in Rocket is um, definitely in the negative. I would consider picking up more shares as they drop back down into the $15 range. Right now, my plan is to hold my shares. Um, I'm not sure if I will sell at the price target. I'm really going to pay attention to this one and see how um, how it does. I really do believe in Rocket in the long term, so past the 12 month window, I think over time there will be possibly some better times to buy at you know a lower cost basis. 
Um, but over time, I do believe that all the positive things with Rocket, with their, their growth in market share, um, some of the, the, the interest rates, higher net income, the mortgage as a service, I think these are really good, good drivers and positives um, that Rocket has in front of them. And so I think this is more of a long-term investment that you have to um, you know, be good where it sits there for a while. Um, I don't I don't believe this is it could take off. We've seen it twice now where um, there's a huge jump in the stock price. Then it goes back down and stays stagnant for a little bit, then jumps back up. Now, I don't think that's going to happen. There's definitely been a lot less volatility in the stock price lately. But just keep that in mind. Um, this, in my opinion, is going to be more of a long term investment than a um, short term. Now. As I just said, there is short-term trading opportunities for Rocket, so just make sure you pay. You know, if you are trading more short-term, um, you just definitely need to keep your um, keep your hand on the pulse um, and just see. But if you're more of a long-term trader, just you know, set some uh, set some cost basis to to lower your cost basis if it continues to go down. Um, and I think we got a winner going, you know, five ten years into the future. So. RKT looks to be a strong, healthy business delivering value, delivering um, you know decent uh, decent uh, earnings to shareholders, and so over the over long periods of time, I believe they're going to be a very good investment. Thank you so much for watching today's video. I do videos on personal finance, investing, and stock analysis. So if you like this type of content, please consider subscribing. If you found anything helpful throughout the video, please hit that like button. Let me know down below what you think about Rocket Mortgage, Rocket Companies. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Frank, Frank Finance, out.